Hi, this is Megan Nixon from HowToSingSmarter.com, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today we're joined by Megan Nixon of HowToSingSmarter.com. And before we dive in, I have a confession to make. When I first heard the name of Megan's website, I wasn't sure about it. Singers want to sing louder, higher, stronger, more confidently, but smarter? As you're going to discover in this conversation, singing smarter is perhaps the most important thing you can do to improve your experience and results as a singer. During the course of her career in music, Megan has helped hundreds of people become better singers and musicians. She works with voice and piano students of all ages, levels, and genres in her private studio in Arvada, Colorado. She is a classically trained vocalist with a degree in jazz performance from Michigan State University, and she's performed in jazz, rock, funk, R&B, bluegrass, and folk bands. She's been teaching voice for 15 years and focuses on healthy singing technique, ear training, and musicianship. In this episode, Megan shares with us the framework she puts in place with all her students that helps them approach new songs, sing the right notes, and even sight sing music they've never seen before. She shares the truth about tone deafness and how she helps first-time singers to quickly get the hang of singing in tune. And she shares how she went from being too scared to even try improvising as a singer to knowing clearly and confidently how to assemble the right notes at the right time. I loved having this chance to chat with Megan and break down what it means to sing smarter and how it can help all those of us who aren't necessarily natural singers to feel just as confident and capable as those who are. My name's Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Megan. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Christopher. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'd love to start at the beginning. Could you tell us a bit about how you got started making music? Yeah, I have always been a singer since I was a little child. I started piano lessons at eight and uh, voice lessons at 11. So my voice teacher, my piano teacher were best friends. I'm from a very small town in Michigan in the U.S. Um, And just from there on, my love of music and my abilities kind of bloomed and I knew that I always wanted to go to school for music and do this as a living. And what were those early experiences of learning like for you? Did you feel like you were just a natural and everything was easy or was it more a matter of hard work and study and discipline and cruel teachers who made you do a lot of homework? (laughs) I did not have any cruel teachers. I had some really spectacular teachers. Um, I, I would say that some things came naturally to me, um, but a lot of it I had to work at. I am definitely a practice singer. I would not say that I came out of the womb sounding amazing. Um, I do remember distinctly when I was 11 years old, and I think I've heard a recording of it since, where it was my first voice lesson, and my tone quality was really nasally. SWV was really popular at the time. I don't know if you remember who they are. So um, it wasn't a good sound, but it didn't take long for my teacher to show me how to do it the right way. Um, so some things came naturally, but I would say I, I put in hundreds of hours of practice to become a really good singer. Mm. And so you were singing through high school and through college then? I was. Um, I was in choir from when I was a little kid to um, all through college and high school. I would say that my challenges in high school and college were more on the ear training side of things. Um, it was that that was not something that I was super natural at. I had a really great, great choir director who did a lot of ear training exercises with us as a class. So, for instance, you know, he'd have the major scale written on the board and then we'd jump around intervallically. Um, and a lot of the kids around me could do it. So I would just listen and follow. But to me, um, it was like pulling a note out of thin air. There was no context. Knowing how to get from do to fa 
did not mean anything to me. I didn't know how you could hear that without singing, you know, do, re, mi, fa, but just do, fa was not something that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and then in college, I ran into some similar things where um, I kind of felt like I almost had a deficit as a musician. Like I knew I was a really good singer, but I didn't think my ear was up to par. And I thought that was just something that I wasn't that good at. Um, so I was a I was a jazz major. And so improvisation is a big part of that. And that is huge as far as ear training goes. Right. So I remember particularly one um I think it was even called ear training class or maybe musicianship class. And we were supposed to do um, a line where we would end on the nine. So, we, you know, maybe it would be like a chord. You'd sing a line and you were supposed to resolve here. But I knew what the nine was conceptually. I knew it was the second scale degree, but I had no idea how to hear that, how to land there. If I was playing it on the piano, that'd be easy. I'd know what note it was, but... I was, I just wasn't good at it and I didn't know why. And I didn't have any teacher who specifically taught me any techniques that were really applicable that I could practice in all 12 keys. And then suddenly, oh, I can hear the nine now. It was just like some random thing that these people were somehow pulling out of the air that I just couldn't do. Sorry, the people around you, could they explain how they did it or did it seem like they just kind of no. instinctively knew? <laughs> yeah. So I went to school with a lot of natural singers, kids who really, you know, had, it almost was like everything was just like aligned perfectly from when they came out of the womb, right? And that's not, that's not most singers, but that I, you know, I did encounter a lot of kids like that and they, they just heard it because they'd heard it over and over and it made sense to them, but my ears just weren't there. I needed an extra step. I needed something applicable that I could sit down at a piano and figure out. Um, and then the, as the instrumentalist, I mean, even if they couldn't hear the nine, they knew where it was. And so they could press that button. But as a singer, you can't do that. You actually have to hear it. It can seem like cheating, can't it? When a pianist yeah. <laughs> just, you know, he just presses the right button and the right note comes out for a exactly. singer. It's not that simple. No. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't until I actually started teaching myself after I graduated, which was pretty much right after I graduated. I've been teaching private lessons for about 15 years that I started to figure out not only how to teach myself those things, but how to teach my students those things. Because if I couldn't do it, certainly I couldn't teach them. Um, and I just found that it's, it's simply a skill. And I got better at it very quickly once I realized that, that it wasn't a deficit that was something that was kind of born in me. It was simply something I hadn't known how to practice correctly. That's really interesting. And were there any particular teachers or resources that helped you find that path to being able to do it? I had a lot of great teachers. I really did. But for instance, the one who focused the most on um, your training, I would say, was my high school choir director, but that wasn't a one on one scenario. And he probably didn't know that I couldn't do it because I'm sitting next to a girl who can and I can follow her, right? So I would, I, it really just was me sitting down and being like, I got to figure out how I can hear these things. And I just kind of worked out some little exercises. I, I don't think that anyone showed me how to do it. I just think knowing how to play the piano was a huge part of that. So I always encourage singers to take piano. It's really kind of the singer's best friend. It's Yeah, it's almost the opposite of singing, isn't it? In that yeah. everything is so visual and linear on the keyboard. Yeah, And you've precise. got that structure. You've got the correct answer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, singing is very different. I know instrumentalists think uh, singing a lot of time is, is uh, <laughs> seems kind of like an intangible study. You know what I mean? Because it's it is very different, and that's one of the reasons too that singers um, sometimes get away with not knowing as much because the nature of the instrument is that you can intuit some of that stuff, right? Without like those the kids that I went to school with who had just kind of natural ears, um, and they could hear that nine, but I couldn't, right? But you know it sometimes you know, singers, it's almost a disadvantage because you don't have to sit down and work those things out. Sometimes you can figure them out just by working with your body, right? But then you're left with not knowing that, how to communicate that. 
I think that's such an important point, and as you say, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, singers can get quite far just on instinct and、mm -hmm. listening without really understanding what they're doing or how to get better. But the catch is, if they really want to be good or they really want to develop their musicality and be able to communicate with other musicians, they're actually in a much blurrier place than、oh, a lot、yeah. of instrument players who've had to do it step by step throughout. Yes, I think that I have.、Uh... My, I would say most of my friends are singers, <laughs> just through all parts of life. And my husband is a piano player,、um, and I have, you know, one of my best friends is an amazing singer, but she does not like to teach, and she doesn't feel like she has the tools to teach because she、uh, she was just always so natural. But I had to work step by step to figure so many things out that I feel like I really have a template of how to teach somebody else how to do that. That's great, and so that led on in due course to you creating the website howtosingsmarter dot com. Yeah, was there a particular inspiration or particular thing that made you think, you know, I should bring this online? I've I've cracked something that other people don't seem to be teaching. Well, at first I created it kind of as supplement supplementary to my students who were studying with me privately. I still have I've got like forty private students. You know, I teach every day, but. But Sundays, and I really it's something I really enjoy.、Um, so I put that online for them initially. But、um, I I think all singers can benefit from this. I've had so many students who are adults who will come into me. Who、uh, someone twenty years ago, a teacher, a parent, told them that they couldn't sing, and so they've been avoiding even a happy birthday in public for the last two decades, right, or three decades.、Um, And there, I realize there's so many people like that who really think they can't sing.、Um, that this would be really beneficial to a lot, you know, to a wide group of people because singing is a pleasure that every human, you know, should be able to happily partake in. You know, and and almost everybody can get better. There really is only I think I think statistically it's like two percent of the population is tone deaf, which. For your audience specifically, means like if I play this note and this note, or sing or sing those notes, a tone deaf person can't hear that this note is higher than this note. Right? They're the same, but most people can hear the difference. And if you can, then you can learn to match those pitches. So I think I've had one student, maybe in fifteen years, who didn't improve, and that's and I've had hundreds of students.、Hmm. So I just thought it was. I want people to get joy from singing because it's such an awesome. I love singing. It's you know it's my favorite thing to do, and everyone should be able to do it. And everyone can, almost everyone can benefit and get better from just some study. I think that's a really valuable message, and I know a lot of our listeners are probably instrumentalists rather than singers, and probably have that hang up about singing. Maybe they had the bad experience in choir as an eight year old, or maybe、mm -hmm. they just. Never dived into that world, so they assume they can't do it. But you're absolutely right. You know, we've had close to a million people take our tone deafness test、ah. at tonedeafness.com, and it backs up that research that it's really,、uh, you know, maybe two percent of people who genuinely can't tell the difference.、Yeah. And what I always say is, if you can enjoy music. You're not tone deaf. Simple as that. Like because you wouldn't have the relative pitch to understand anything in what you're hearing. Yeah. And so if you enjoy music, there's absolutely no reason why you can't learn to sing in tune. That's that's a great point. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there were a couple of things that really drew me to how to sing smarter when I discovered it, and they really resonated with the way we approach singing at Musical U.、Mm -hmm. And those were firstly, as you say, the the focus on helping people who are at that very beginner stage, learning to match pitch, learning basic vocal control, and helping them pass some of that emotional anxiety about singing out loud in front of、yeah. people. And the other is the sulfur system and movable dose sulfur in particular,、yep. which I think people put it into two categories. They either think it's super basic and just for kids, or they think it's super advanced and way beyond them.、Mm -hmm. And I love the way you teach it on your website because you show that actually it's just a very practical tool for getting a, a deep understanding of what you're singing. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about how you approach those two things on HowToSingSmarter dot com? So one was solfege. I'm sorry. What was the other one? So singing、Beginners? in tune and matching. Singing、pitch. in tune. Okay.、Mm. Well, I print those are those go hand in hand for me.、Um, when I am teaching a student who has trouble matching pitch, and I mean, you know, a student comes in and、um, the first thing I do is just have them sing like a simple vocal exercise. Maybe that's a little too fa fancy. Maybe I have them sing, you know. 
and then I gauge if they can sing that, then we're cool. And then we go on and, you know, do some harder things. But if they have trouble matching pitch immediately, then um, the first thing I'll do with them is kind of jump around within their register, um, having them close their eyes, listen to the note, hum the note, and then try to sing it. And usually within literally 10 to 15 minutes, people are much better at it. It's about focusing on something that they've never focused on before. They're just going to, you know, if they're not actually focusing on, this is a pitch, this is an exact place. This is a, you know, um, a distinct thing that you can focus on uh, and then aim for and then hit. Um, and then the next thing that we'll do is start with a major scale. And that's always where I start because kind of in, you know, in music language, we almost compare everything to major scales or major intervals, you know, and more than half of the songs that we sing are going to be in major keys. It's more common. And being able to sing that simple major scale in tune um, is the beginning to be able to sing a song in tune. I would say like a major scale is just like a really boring song, <laughs> right? A song is just going to be some other, you know, version of those notes, but it's the same intervals. It's the same notes. So what we do is we start with me playing the piano as they sing. Um, and usually it'll stay there for a while if they have a hard time matching pitch. And I'll show them how to play the C major scale on the keyboard. So they can go home, sit at a piano or even a, even a virtual keyboard if that's all they have available to them, and sing each pitch as they play it and try to lock in, right? So when you sing a note with the piano and it locks in, you can feel it. There's like a buzz. But if you're you know, they're trying to find those pitches. But then there's that moment when I see it on their faces that they can feel the connection between the pitch on the piano and the, what they're singing. So I really, you know, I really focus on the major scale and solfege is a really important tool for that. And then once you get past something simple, uh, simple like being able to sing the major scale in tune a cappella, the next thing that I do is just go in stepwise motion moving around the scale. You know, something like, and I would be pointing to a chart that has the solfege written on it. You know, do, re, mi, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi, re, do. So we're staying in stepwise motion. And then the next step, once they get that, is to start doing some jumping around and stuff like that. So on how to sing smarter, I basically have... Um, for each interval, I have a little exercise that's worked out that you can practice in all 12 keys so you can hear how to jump from do to that particular note, fa, ti, re, whatever. And it's really helpful because usually once we get through all those 12 keys, that student starts to hear that distance a little bit better. Mm -hmm. It's all about context. When I was confused about ear training in high school and college, I thought that you had to just pull those notes randomly out of the air. I didn't think about it in context of the scale itself. Um, and it's just a, it's one of the best tools I've, I've ever used for helping someone improve pitch. Even someone who has excellent pitch, um, then we'll go on to a chromatic solfege scale to something that's, you know, quite a bit more difficult. It's like kind of like endless resource in, in ear training. It definitely can be, and I love that you see it kind of as the building blocks to get them through the various stages of understanding the singing and the notes they're singing. I think what trips a lot of people up, we have a lot of people who come to our website who have been, you know, looking around at YouTube tutorials and they've been doing karaoke and they, they've been told that their pitch on tuning is a bit off, but they have no idea how to tackle that except to keep singing songs. And of course, if, if you start singing lessons with a trained teacher like yourself, they're going to start you more from the beginning. But I think online, there's a real danger that people just don't understand. There are building blocks, you know, start out just singing one note and getting that right, and then introduce a few notes from the scale. And, and you know, from there, some teachers will just go straight to songs. But I love that you actually continue on that kind of methodical path of let's assemble a framework for relative pitch, something that you can apply in any key and to any song. Yes, exactly. And and song study is definitely a big part of, you know, vocal study as well. Uh, learning vocal technique, how to breathe, um, you know, making sure your tone is beautiful, all those things. But nobody cares about any of that if you're singing out of tune. Right? That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> you can have a, and it's interesting, di different 
people have different strengths and weaknesses. I've had students come in with beautiful tone who have really hard time with pitch. They're not all things that go together. It's, you know, different strengths and weaknesses. Or I can have a student with great tone whose pitch is not very good. Um, and so it's, you know, it's all of those things put together that create, you know, something that's appealing to listen to. So if we imagine a singer who has got the basics of singing in tune, and then we imagine them on two paths, one of which is built on solfege and understanding these notes and the relationships, and the other is on maybe a more traditional, just song by song repertoire based path. What difference does solfege make? Why is that such a core part of the way you teach? That's a good question. Um, song study, like I said, is very important because it builds um, pitch association and all of those things that, you know, that solfege study does as well. Um, but it's just a, a, a better way to break things down and, and kind of focus on, you know, one little thing at a time and then you get better and better and better. It's, it's supplemental. It's something that goes with the song study to me. No one would want to come into voice lessons for years and just sing solfege. That would be incredibly boring, right? <laughs> so in my, like a typical lesson for me, we're doing that for 15 minutes and then we're singing for 45, right? But there's always, you know, um, you know, this, you know, that interval that you're having a hard time with is a perfect fifth. It's do to so, right? And that, that connection can help the student then sing that in tune because mm -hmm. now they recognize it. Great. I think for me as a singer in school years, I, I came across intervals and ear training only in the context of sight singing. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was how you did it, but they didn't actually teach us the ear training. They just kind of said, you know, this is this interval, therefore sing the note. And I, I was kind of left stranded, like you were describing earlier, yes. you know, people could pluck it from thin air yes. and telling me it was a major third didn't do anything to help me sing it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And I think about that a lot. And I talk to my students about that because uh, there's a lot of people who want to be good at sight singing and it's a really great skill, you know, as a singer, um, who wants to be in a choir or who wants to be in a band or whatever, or just someone who wants to be able to read music. But just like you said, if you're looking at a piece of music and you intellectually know that, that you're supposed to jump up a major six, but you have no idea what a major six sounds like, it doesn't matter, right? You could, you could have all the information intellectually, and if you don't have the ear behind it, you can't sing it. So ear training is first and then sight singing. Mm. Or they can go together, but it has to be at the same time. You can't start with sight singing. Agreed. And I, I think you touched on something else interesting earlier, which was that for you, ear training and improvisation as a singer went closely together. Can you tell mm. us more about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of people think this, and I probably was one of those when I first started. I, I was always classically trained. So from when I was eight and then I got into college with a, a classical scholarship, and it wasn't until my, uh, I think my sophomore year where we actually got a jazz department at MSU, and I switched over. Um, so all of my practice, all of my study before that point had been classical music, and there's very little, you know, room for improvisation in classical music. And <clears throat> so when I was put in a scenario when I had to just kind of like pull it out of nowhere and improvise, I was terrified. We did this thing on the first day when I switched from classical to jazz, where we sat in a circle um, with all these other kids that I just met at like 19. And uh, we had to go trading fours, right? So everybody sings, there's a piano player and everybody sings four bars and then you kind of pass the musical baton to the next person and they sing something in response. Um, and no one was great at it, but I could not even, I froze. I could not even get it to come out of my mouth. It was a terrifying proposition that I was potentially about to sound terrible, right? I was, I was practiced. I always sounded good. I was always on top of things classically, but then when I had to kind of create something on the spot, it was terrifying. And it didn't have anything to do with ears in that way. It just was my own fear of not of wrong notes, right? I think is it I think it's Mouse Davis who said something like there are no wrong notes. You know, just poor choices, something like that. <laughs> I might be misquoting it, but that's the idea. Um but I did I realized again, like after really I had graduated that improvisation is not someone pulling random stuff out of the air. It's somebody hearing the notes specifically in each chord 
being able to take those notes and create a melody with it. So you're not just singing, if you have, you know, a chord that's happening, you're not just singing, you know, just anything. You're singing those chord tones, right? And so something that was really helpful to me as far as improvisation is that, and actually I did learn this in college. My vocal teacher had us do this. So let's say we're, you know, sing, uh, we have a piece. She would give us eight bars. We'd have to play the chords and sing up the chords and then, you know, take it piece by piece, uh, try to sing a pattern maybe uh, on that chord, maybe the same pattern, even on each chord. So you're starting to hear through those chords. And then I realized like, this is not just something that people are randomly hearing. This again is, can be taught, studied, perfected. You know, there's definitely a part of improvisation that's on the spot and that is really fun and it's about the performance. But if you don't have the language underneath it, you're not going to say anything that sounds good. You know what I mean by that? Like Mm. there's fundamental, uh, you know, musical things that, that you can practice and learn that make you a good improviser. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds like a a great exercise and it's similar to some of what we teach for instrumentalists at Musical U is how to find those chord tones and use them as the basis for improv. Um, Could you give us an example of what that would sound like if a singer was improvising based on the chord tones? Sure. Well, first, let's say that just starting on the most simple thing, I'm playing a C major 7 chord, and you just start with... And maybe then you'd if you don't have a lot of ideas of what you'd want to do, you just maybe take those four chord tones, put them in a different order. And then you just try to see what comes out of your mouth and then you can test it back and see if you're hitting the right notes. There's the nine that I couldn't hear before. So, um... Just actually sitting on one chord like that can be helpful. I do have an exercise that I do with singers that I think is um, helpful and also helpful to instrumentalists, which is just going through each of the five types of seventh chords and moving one uh, note each time, because they're only a half step away. So for instance, you go, then the dominant, then the minor, as a starting point for jazz specifically it's a little bit more mm-hmm. complicated right but um just sitting in one chord and hanging out there and trying to create melodies using even just the four chord tones or then starting with the whole scale or trying to you know land on a nine or land on a 11 or whatever uh, but to do that as a singer you have to know how to play the piano mm-hmm. or you have to have somebody do it for you better you can do yourself, right? But I wouldn't have been able to figure out any of that stuff if I could not play the piano. That's a a great tip for people. I think a lot of singers shy away from the piano because it can be a bit intimidating as an instrument to to fully learn and play. But as you point out, you know, just picking out some notes can provide you with a great basis for doing these kinds of exercises. Yeah, it could be simple. It could just, uh, I've sung with some really excellent singers who I was absolutely surprised and amazed when they'd be like, oh, that music theory stuff, I'll leave that to you. I'm like, what? All I'm doing is figuring out our starting pitches by the chord that it's being played or whatever. So um, it's just so important, and particularly to communicate with other musicians. Mm, and it, it can be empowering too, I think. Yeah. I, I love the the chord exercise you just demonstrated is another great example of how having a framework in your head as a singer makes such a difference. You know, you're not picking notes at random. You're not just following the notes on the page. You actually understand the meaning of those notes musically and they fit into a certain pattern in your head that you've practiced and learned. Yeah, I think of it like when you first are trying improvisation or let's just talk about like it's a specific song. It's like a field full of snow, right? And then you start making pathways through that field of snow and it starts getting easier and it starts making more sense and you can traverse that land more easily because you're trying things, you're hearing things. Um, And suddenly there are all these pathways and all these choices and you could go in this direction or this direction or this direction because you've trained your ear to do that. That's when the creativity starts. Once you know the language, then you can be expressive. 
when I first, <laughs> I remember like one of my first uh, vocal attempts at improvisation, I thought it sounded awesome, but it did not. I think I, I, I think it was not so awesome. And what it was, I was just like trying to make it fancy. I was just in my head, Ella Fitzgerald, and like just trying to go for the sounds that I thought were good, but I wasn't listening at all. I was listening to me, but I wasn't listening to the chords. And of course, Ella Fitzgerald had a monster ear, so really it was nothing like what she would have sang. But, um, you know, uh, it's just all of it can be broken down, skills that can be improved, you know, and I think that builds confidence. Obviously, being better at something makes you more confident at it. But if you don't know how to get better, then you're just kind of stuck somewhere. Absolutely. I think there's such power in understanding how you do what you do. It's not enough just to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. If you can understand it, you can talk to other people about it. You know how to improve it. You can stand up on stage and do it knowing that you will do it correctly because you understand the process. Yeah. It, it makes such a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So you have such a useful and practical and unusual, I think, approach to teaching singing. And I love that the name of your website is howtosingsmarter.com mm -hmm. because I think it is a smarter approach. It's not just let's do a bunch of songs, let's go to karaoke every week and hope we get better as a singer. Yeah. It's a very thought through and step by step approach to actually honing your craft mm -hmm. and developing your instrument as a singer. Yeah, thank you. I, I, that, that's, that was my goal. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. So tell us a bit more about what people can find on your website. Um, there's a good amount of stuff and I'm, I'm adding it's, it's, it's not as, I haven't been doing it for a super long time. So there's a good, I mean, it would take you a few months to get through what's on there. Um, and I, you know, I keep adding to it, but basically there's kind of two main parts that I focus on, on how to sing smarter. One is a uh, healthy singing technique, which is very important. First of all, just to sound better, but also so people do not hurt their voices. I have so many people who usually it's younger people honestly, teenagers <laughs> who are singing too loud, singing too hard, trying to sing songs that are out of their register. Um, so it's just really important to treat your voice uh, as kindly as possible. So there's lots of how to breathe properly, lots of breathing instruction on there, um, tone quality, how not to strain, things like that. So some really fundamental things that are just important to understand as a singer. And then the other side is the music, you know, the, the musicianship side, which is ear training and sight singing and even piano. Um, cause like I said, I really think, you know, the pan piano is such a beautiful map of music, of music theory. It's really easy to understand when you look at it like that. Um, so there's lots of, uh, there's lots of warm up exercises. There's videos, tutorials. There's lots of like what I was explaining earlier. Lots of soul fetch practice where we, um, I teach you how to hear me and so and T and Ray, not just from Do but from anywhere in the scale, uh, with specific exercises that you can practice in all twelve keys that I actually play on the piano for you. So if they don't play, it's okay, right? So they can just follow along. Um, and then more complicated things that are similar where we're hearing minor intervals and things like that. So there's a lot of ear training. I'd say it's heavy on ear training and technique. Fantastic. Well, I think you were being quite humble when you said there's not that much on there yet. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like there's a wealth of useful resources for people. There's some stuff, yeah. There's some stuff on there. <laughs> well, I would highly recommend if you've been listening to this and thinking that you've always worried you couldn't sing, or maybe you've dabbled but known your tuning was off, or you're intrigued by this idea of solfege as a kind of framework for understanding the notes you're singing, I'd highly recommend heading over to howtosingsmarter.com and taking a look at everything that Megan has created there. Thank you again, Megan, for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Christopher. This was so much fun. I really appreciate having a chance to talk to your audience and hopefully, you know, uh, helping some people sing better. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. So are you feeling ready to level up how smart your singing is? I love talking with Megan about the concepts and techniques she uses to train smarter singers, and I'm sure you can see now how her website lives up to its name and really can help you to have greater enjoyment and success in your singing. The reality is that although singers can go a long way just relying on an instinctive ability to learn by ear, you can only get so far without training your ears and your brain to understand what you're singing. If you want to get really good, if you want to sight sing, if you want to improvise, or if you have trouble even just getting started and singing in tune, 
The good news is that you can take a clear, step-by-step approach that gives you the frameworks you need to succeed. A big pitfall for self-taught singers is that they focus exclusively on learning songs, and that leaves them without the building blocks and understanding they really need to improve. Although this kind of song study is important, Megan always includes 15 minutes of selfish work with her students to provide them with the ear they'll need to sing the songs well. Solfege is a big part of how Megan teaches, but it's not the only framework she gives her students. For example, if they're having trouble singing in tune, she'll take them step by step through listening, imagining, humming, and then singing one note, before moving on to more complex exercises based on the scale. And when it comes to improvisation, she shared how you can use the chords of a song as a source of good-sounding notes, and do exercises for that, which will help you choose musically effective notes when you improvise as a singer. Then, with sight reading, she explained how you need to develop your oral understanding of the relationships between the notes, not just the intellectual understanding of the music theory. All of this comes together in the overall mission of helping singers to sing smarter. Through her website, howtosingsmarter.com, Megan shares videos, articles, tutorials, and more to help you sing in a smarter way and equip you with the kinds of frameworks that can transform your abilities and your confidence as a singer. If you have hesitated to start singing, or you've been learning to sing and felt like you were missing out on some fundamentals that other people seem to have, I hope that you found this episode really useful and that you'll head over to howtosingsmarter.com to learn more. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about using chord tones for playing by ear and improvisation. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com, where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners. That's Musicality